You probably all read this book. For me, it was 10th grade, uh, called Tale of Two Cities, by Charles Dickens, right? And it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. I didn't think I could ever come across another more memorable and powerful opening uh, in terms of a book. Uh, I didn't think I could find it until I saw Professor Gordon Chang's book. <laughs> and if you want to look at the very first page of his introduction, you will see this line. There was China before there was America. And it is because of China that America came to be. That is going to be the line that I will remember for my children and grandchildren to pass on because that's the meaning that I feel in terms of China, but in terms of America, another piece of it, that relationship that is so profound, um, I dare say to Professor Chang, your subtitle will be, well, of course, Faithful Ties, A Tale of Two Countries. So I uh, want to tell you that we were very lucky to have him here today, and he's a uh, long-standing uh, member, of course, of the uh, Stanford faculty, scholar, researcher, a writer, and uh, this latest book is, is lighting a fire in this country in terms of discussion about China and America, and today you have a chance to engage uh, Dr. Chang, so without any other, uh, without any further delay, I want to call him up to um, make his presentation. Dr. Chang? I don't know if I can live up to that introduction, my goodness, <laughs> Charles Dickens. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, uh, Institute, 1990 Institute, for having me here today. Uh, it's nice to meet you and to speak. I have a lot of respect for teachers. Uh, I have a lot of respect for the teaching profession, and um, I applaud all that you do. Um, I also, I think there are a couple of you who are from the uh, Alice Fong Yu School in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, all right. Maybe more than a couple. So just, just, just to make the connection, Alice Fong Yu, for whom the school is named, is my aunt. And Al, Al, I'm on my mother's side, I'm a Fong. So Alice Fong and Helen Fong were my mothers uh, and aunt. And Alice, you may not know, was named after Alice Roosevelt. And my mother, Helen, was named after Helen Taft. And her bro their brother was named Theodore, Theodore Roosevelt, and Taft, and Hiram, and goes on the line. This was that generation. And still, you know, many families name their offspring for auspicious, or what they believe is auspicious people or important people. So that's to make a connection. And there are a couple of you from Palo Alto, from East Palo Alto, Ravenswood. I don't know if the gentleman's here. And a couple from Castilea, uh, who, uh, the school well familiar with Castilea. Okay. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here to share with you uh, some reflections on this book of mine, which came out just a few months ago. And I have uh, a short period of time, so I will be brief in my comments so we can have some time for discussion, which I appreciate. Uh, <clears throat> the book came about um, when an editor at Harvard University Press phoned me up and said uh, a few years ago, now maybe five years ago, uh, you, do you know somebody who can write something about the history of America-China relations? And that's something I've been thinking about and writing about for many years. And so I gave her some names. And uh, she didn't seem to be bowled over. And she got back to me and she said, well, Gordon, you know, why don't you do it? <laughs> you know? So I was in the middle of another book right at the time, and I didn't really want to take up another, yet another book, but it was, she made a, a good case, and uh, this was something which I had been thinking about for many, many years, and I said, if I don't do it now, I'll never do it. So this is sort of a broad, uh, uh, this is a result of a career of thinking about America-China relations. So then I, asked, I thought about, well, what am I going to say? And then it just occurred to me that what I wanted to do with this book was to give a history of the present. So your title of this instance is workshop is China Now, the Present. This book, I'm a historian. This is a history of the now. That is, how did we get to this point? How did America 
and I use America instead of the United States because the United States I refer to in the book is more or less referring to the state. We don't call ourselves the United Statesians. We don't have, you know, not like French and France and French. You know, so in the United States that we call America, it's more of a civil society, everyday people, citizens or not. This is, this is our, the, the, the country, the society, as opposed to the state. And so the book is not a diplomatic history. It's not a political history, so it's not about state relations, but it is a book about relations between people. And in particular, as the focus is on American perceptions, American attitudes, observations about China from the very earliest beginnings. So it's sort of what Paul hinted to uh, about, uh, as I said, how the book begins, because the argument is that the Americans have had a peculiar uh, fascination long term with China. And so our current fascination, our preoccupation, our obsession of some, my editor said, why don't you put obsession somewhere in the time? I said, it's a little too strong. So it's preoccupation. Uh, what, what goes back for very early times. And I would argue that more than any other country, Americans through 350 years have had a peculiar fascination with China. And, link, and have linked China to America's destiny. So that's where the fateful ties come. So when Americans think about uh, countries, um, Americans often think about old countries in Europe from which they came, or other lands of ancestry from which they came. But when they think about the future, I suggest, is they think, and what's coming to be, it's often been about China. So that's sort of the, the, the overview of, of the book. Um, as I said, <clears throat> I've written about China and U-America-China relations through my career. This is the title, cover of my first book back in 1990, which, was, which is a political diplomatic history, um, kind of security sort of uh, concerns about the triangular relationship between the great powers at that time. But over the years, I've gotten to be less interested in state power and more interested in uh, social context, in ideology, in culture, the, the mindset that people have because policy was always made within mindsets, including at the top level. People were all just people. So what is sort of these mindsets that have uh, very much shaped uh, um, this relationship? And this book continues to have relevance, particularly uh, well here, but also now re renewed in China when they just came out with this uh, new um, translation of the book um, last year. Uh, but they changed the title a little bit to make it more provocative. Instead of the English title, the Chinese title is uh, Friend or Enemy. And so, so this is sort of showing a resident of something right now. Um, now I'm going to start out with something, a few images which you may say, uh, Chang has kind of lost his marbles here. This is about China. You know, what's, what's uh, Jay-Z and Beyonce doing on the cover here? Well, I'll let you figure it out uh, for a few moments. A couple of other slides, see if you can figure out what the reason is, and maybe some of you know, but don't leak it yet. Uh, so here's, here they are on the red carpet, and then followed by uh, Rihanna. If you don't know who these people are, I, uh, <laughs> never mind, you know, they're just celebrities. They're, 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 they're what my daughters listen to, and you know, they're singer celebrities. And uh, Rihanna, it was said that it was, she was, her gown looked like a walking egg omelet <laughs> or pizza or something <laughs> like that. And then Sarah Jessica Parker doesn't look very sexy in this, <laughs> you know, sex in the city, just Sarah just in this whatever she's got on. Uh, and then, but then there, and then the ever present, unfortunately, uh, Kim Kardashian uh, is, there, um, but uh, then all was not disaster, and you had Kate Hudson looking quite uh, glamorous uh, in that gown. Well, if you look closely, what the theme of all these gowns are is supposedly Chinese-inspired, right? Sort of Chinese motifs and design and so forth. And um, this was the occasion of, is that, now does anybody know where these were? We're all, most of us are West Coast people, or far, far west out in the Hawaii area. Yes? It was the Met 
the Met Ball, the Met Gala back uh, a few months ago, the opening of a blockbuster show, three floors taking place in the, mess, in, the, in the Met, 300 gowns and costumes. It's an unprecedented show in the Met, and there's a big social, political, you know, business, celebrity, you know, there's Hollywood and New York uh, engaged with each other. And this was absolutely right. This is the name of the show. The gala opened on May 6th, and uh, all sorts of people showed up to have their photos taken, supposedly with the women. Oh, and also there were some men. I didn't show him, but he's, this is too much, uh, is Justin Bieber. Also had a Chinese <coughs> something on. And, <laughs> but, you know, so there weren't all just women. There were also guys who had supposedly Chinese-inspired uh, <coughs> outfits. But China through the looking glass, and uh, I show this as some humorous, but just to, you know, people think, oh, this is short of this, this great fascination and the elite and, and popular culture all, you know, into China. Well, when I look at this, I also, and I talk about this in the book, this is in some sense not new. This is a continuation or an, an echo, a resonance of things that had happened in the past. And I think about, I said, Helen Taft, uh, namesake for my mother, uh, or Julia Grant, U Ulysses S. Grant's um, wife. Both of them, first ladies at their inaugural balls, wore gowns that were China-inspired. You, uh, you can go to the Museum of American History, go to the top floor, and they have a whole beautiful room of all, uh, a lot of the gowns worn by first ladies. And you can, I went there a couple of years ago, and I just, whoa, I was really surprised. I didn't know that. Um, so, but that's the sort of, it's a, this is the reason of showing this, is that they are these historical connections. So that the present, the now, is just not now, is not the eternal present, <laughs> but it does have a past. And this, and we are inheritors of this past. And so the book hopes to give some context to this currency. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned Julia Grant. I should, I should also mention something else which Paul didn't. I'm also a consultant on a TV program right now, which I should plug a little bit. And some of you may know of this. It's called Hell on Wheels. You know, Hell on Wheels, which is now in its fifth season. And the fifth, this is a, doc, a drama. It's not a documentary. It's a drama about the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. And the first four seasons have, have, have focused on the Union Pacific, and they've had the show, the, the, the worker, the Union soldiers who are working, and Irish immigrants, and African American freedmen, and all this working on the railroad. And now this year they switched over to the Central Pacific, which was our, pl our part of the woods, and now they have lots of Chinese who were 80% of the railroad force, and so they con contacted me um, to consult. But anyway, uh, Ulysses S. Grant makes a little appearance as a connection with, with it. So, but it's interesting. This also, the Transcontinental Railroad is an important link between America and China. And 15, 12 to 15,000 Chinese did work on the railroad to help build, uh, to complete it. So there are these links that I try to make uh, today. Well, there are other links. Now, there are the business links, which some of you may have seen this in person yourself. It's sort of a cool image. Uh, it looks sort of eerie. In fact, this is Shanghai, and this is the uh, flagship store in Shanghai for Apple. Uh, Apple kind of looks like a hologram over there in this glass uh, entry to the massive store that's in downtown or in the new business district in Shanghai. It sort of reminds me of I.M. Pei's entrance to the Louvre, you know, the glass pyramid, and you kind of go down into the into the site. Well, when this Apple decided to go big into China in 2012, two, well, when they opened it up, uh, Tim Cook, the CEO, said China, uh, the future of Apple is in China. And, uh, he, and already this year, Apple, 30% of Apple's worldwide uh, total revenue comes from sales in China. And 30% of Apple's worldwide revenue is more than the whole revenue that Google makes. I mean, it's so, and so he said, the sky's the limit. And he said, one day, uh, Google, uh, Apple will sell more, more revenue will come from China than anywhere else in the world. And there are Apple stores all over uh, China. And so this is sort of the business person's view of, of, uh, of, of the China market and the famous China market, which goes back to the earliest beginnings of American, the American economy, the early China trade, in before there was even the United States. And that's sort of what the, the, the title, the opening line that Paul mentioned, it got those words, a China connection before there was even a United States. 
and it goes back to the early China trade when China Yankee traders and the Yankee and China clippers and so forth made lots of money in the tea trade and the fur trade. And uh, there were two mainstays or two bulwarks of the early American economy, and one was the slave trade and the other was the Pacific China trade. And, and so that's important, too, as a reminder, as we think about the business issues today, this is the line trying to get into that store uh, on opening day. And uh, I had other pictures, you know, of the inside of the store, which is about, looks like twice the size of any Apple store, three times the size of any Apple store that I know of in the United States. Well, all is not positive. That is all not, all, all the, I should say that some of you know uh, Warren Buffett, you know, Warren Buffett, the great investor, supposed to be the biggest, most successful investor in, in America or in history, and Warren Buffett is very keen on China, and he said China has been extraordinary. He, just, he said that somehow China has been able to tap the potential of the country like in, in no other way, and he's been quite admiring of, of, and he and Bill Gates go to China quite a bit, but Warren Buffett has been to China three, four times in the past few years. And he's put his money where his mouth is, where you know, Berkshire Hath Hathaway's put in billions of dollars of investment in, in China. So he doesn't think China is going away by any means. But other people are fearful of China, and this is sort of the downside or the negative side, which runs as a current in America-China relations. There is a fascination, obsession, interest, attraction, but also a fear about China. And these are just a few titles I've pulled off the the web from Amazon, and you can go through. This is a cottage industry to write a book, uh, fear, I would say, fear mongering about China. And you have dozens of these books, and you can see just by the titles alone, these are not especially uh, extreme that in, in terms of, uh, are selective. I mean, these are just a few of the, of the and they're very sensational, and people want to sell books, of course, but you see certain themes that run throughout this. It's really quite dire. I mean, you look at just the, the, the picture and sort of, uh, speaks to and, 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 and encourages this uh, fear of China. And as you also notice, which I didn't notice until I kind of looked at this, they all got dragons on the cover. I mean, these snarling dragons are everywhere, which has come to be sort of, you know, the symbol of, of China. Um, and, and more of them, you know, these are even some of the other day, I put more dragons, you know, they're all, all over the place. Um, I sort of like the, the cover on the far right, the codependency of China and America, you know, so, sort of the sense that the two are locked into an unhealthy relationship. Uh, but this is sort of the themes in a lot of these that, the, that this is not a good uh, situation. Uh, but when we go back and think about it, there are all sorts of, of precedents uh, to this modern yellow peril, which I call it, going back to the 19th century, which would culminate in 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act, and as many of you know about that, and this was sort of the same, they, this fear in, in 18, 1870s and 1880s that China literally was going to take over America, that China was going to literally destroy American, the, the republic, and um, this, this, this required extreme measures, which included excluding Chinese from in, coming into the country, this, uh, this literature at the time suggested as infiltrators, as somehow usurpers of, uh, of American uh, life, and, and that's why this unprecedented act was passed that changed immigration policy within, in 1882. Uh, so we still, in, in much of it, when I read this, 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 this resonates. Uh, so uh, there, are, there are these visions of unlimited wealth as a uh, businessman in uh, the eight, 1990s, said after China began to open up under Deng Xiaoping, he said uh, he relished this thought of the China market opening up to Americans once again, and he said, can you ima imagine it, uh, 200 billion, two, two billion armpits in need of deodorant. You know, so, so, so that image is sort of what, I guess you say, inspired, uh, I, I won't say whet at the appetite because it's sort of mixed metaphors there or something, mixed images. But anyway, that's the, but, but then there's also this view of China as a danger and threat. Well, I'm going to end here with a few images, and Paul started out now as, uh, as history, as social science folks. You, anyone that's a local folk, who, is, who and where is this? Koi Tower. Tower, and it's... A, a statue, bronze statue of who? Columbus. What the hell? <laughs> what the heck? Me, what the heck 
is Columbus doing at the base of Coit Tower in San Francisco. Columbus never made it to North America. To, I mean, the closest he got was kind of like Haiti or Cuba or somewhere down there, right? And to his dying day, Columbus thought that he had made it all the way to Asia. And, and he, had, he, he miscalculated the circumference of the globe by about a third. So that's why he thought he was a sort of in the, in, the, in the East, what called the East Indies, as opposed to in the West Indies, you know, another name that gets all confused because of Columbus's mistake. Uh, and he thought that he was on his way to Asia, in particular to China. And he carried with him a, a very a personal copy of Marco Polo's travels. And next to the word of Peking, he writes in Italian, uh, innumerable, incalculable uh, commerce. You know, this was the image of the time. And that, on his, on his scabbard, uh, on next to him, this was a you know, generous gift from the local Italian-American community to San Francisco to honor one of their native, I can't say native sons, but someone that they are, are proud of. Uh, and, um, but he's looking westward uh, over the city, uh, over the hills uh, to the Pacific, and on his, on his one hand, he's got his uh, mandate from Queen Isabella, and on his scabbard, he's got inscribed uh, his, inf his famous words, uh, go to the east by way of the west. The east in capital E, that is the far east, by way of the west, that is to go across the Atlantic uh, to get to Asia, not to go around the other way. And so that's, that's his famous sort of uh, words, which is sort of symbolic, or you can say as a metaphor for us today. We're still going to the East to find ourselves and to benefit ourselves. Well, here's another, another where is this? Very good. All right, no, no, uh, has any. Capital Rotunda in Sacramento. And what is this? This statue, this It's Christopher Columbus again, <laughs> and Queen Isabella. And they're sitting in the rotunda of the California State Capitol building, marble donated in the 1890s or something like this. And it's the same thing, is that you know, they're honoring what they believe are the, uh, the, the vision that the two had. And the California itself is a product of this uh, epic vision of the East and the West being connected by Columbus's vision. And that's how I come to think that before there was America, there was China, and because of China, there was America, as we had, have inherited that epic vision. So I come up to today and say, I look all around, and all over the place I see echoes of this past. Obviously, so much is new, so much is different, and you know, all is not just old, and there are all sorts of new things that are going on. But to put it in a certain context and to uh, sort of understand sort of, the, I think, some of the attitudes and fears and beliefs and fascination with China, it's helpful to have a long-term view of our past engagement. Well, uh, we have a few moments here. I think I tried to got it on time here to, to have good, some, some discussion, but I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Or any comments or objections. <laughs> Yes. How do you work with young people? How do you work with young people to move them beyond the fetish fetishization, if that's a word, of the Met Ball um, and those lovely books? Of, do you fear the big bad dragon? Well, I think it's a it's a question. It's an excellent question. Uh, the fetishization of the present or the eternal now. Um, it's, a, it's a question many of us face, particularly as historians, and, and people think, you know, the past is just past. But it's a general question, you know, the past has never passed, you know, it's not over. And, um, and we are all products of the past. We're all products of, we're all historical products. Our, our culture, our society, we ourselves, we're in our hair, our families. So let's talk about how important, and here I'm plugging for history importance of appreciating the past as, as we are products of, of, of what has come before. So that's what I would 
would try to prompt, you know, students. Uh, my daughter, who's, uh, when she was uh, eight or nine, she said something, you know, I don't think she's a budding academic herself. Maybe she will. But she said, you know, Dad, um, and she knows I was, what I do, and she said, yeah, you know, it's, it's the future that tells the past. And I said, what do you mean by this? Well, you don't know what goes on and happens in the past. You don't know what's, and he, she said, you know, like right now, sometimes we don't know what's going on. It's only when we get out here and look back on it, we can understand what's going on. I said, wow. <laughs> yes, please. All right. He's got a radio announcer's voice. So here's what I'm wondering. Um, the preoccupation of China from our end here, uh, the book titles are all about China the threat, but it, w but it would seem to me that the really big question that everybody wants to know if there's a preoccupation is to what extent will China change dramatically and, and, and go democratic, it, it would seem to me. Um, does, does the Chinese, do the Chinese wonder to what extent, given our politics today, do they spend a lot of time preoccupied with the question of to what extent can we continue to survive as a, as a single entity given the way that we are breaking up today? Do they spend time looking at us like we look at them? Um, a lot of questions in, 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 uh, embedded in your, your comment uh, and question. Uh, of course, we say the Chinese, you know, 1.4 billion people uh, and, uh, and all sectors from the very top, at least you had a great panel earlier, you know, China is, and I think it's important to, to, to appreciate China is really is a very diverse place and Chinese have a wide variety of opinions and even within the Communist Party and the top Communist leadership there are different opinions and have always been different opinions, even at the height of Mao's power. I mean, one way to understand Mao's power and the, and, and the the terror of the, of the Cultural Revolution is that there were different opinions, and he had de he was trying to deal with them, and ultimately those different opinions won out over Mao. Mao failed in his vision; it didn't last him a few much beyond after he passed away, and uh, the Gang of Four and all that, and the Deng Rung Deng Show that there, and that these different factions, if you will, within the Communist Party were very very strong. And they had very different visions of their uh, f view of the future. And I would suspect that that's the case. I mean, they're, they're, they're very powerful leaders, and, and people have very strong opinions, and they have very different opinions about uh, a lot of things. So I meet Chinese young people. Uh, they're, con they're concerned. Uh, some of them have the view, the dominant view of, of the government about the future of China, the strength of China, the rise of China. Others are fearful about the China falling apart. Uh, some are very adamant that Tibet and, and, and Taiwan have to be part of China. And others, to my surprise, in recent years have said, I don't see why Taiwan has to be part of China. And that was just an ath. I mean, that was, uh, sh I was a shock to me when I heard these were pe st some students from Peking University. So, so I, I think there is a, a genuine, you know, sub uh, uh, official or sub open, you know, uh, discussion. Sometimes it breaks out in the open. Uh, but that's how I would respond is say that, that this, is, uh, this is a big, a big issue. Um, overall, as a generalization, I'd say Chinese. <laughs> deep inside uh, are very invested in, 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 in unity and stability and prosperity, which they see as needing some coherence, social and national political coherence. So that's the emphasis, not, not to say that everyone thinks that. But I think as a generalization, yes, uh, the, the fear of China, Chinese disintegration and chaos, whether it's cultural revolution or imper from imperialism, or whatever, is quite, I think, palpable. And no one, I think, very few people would want to see that. And this is, I think, sort of, in my own personal view, which I see of a contrast between attitude, like some of these books, is uh, 
There's a, there is a, there is a, a journalist on Fox News who has, has the same name as my, I do. We, we, we bedevil, he bedevils me. I don't know how he feels about it. He's Gordon G. Chang. I'm Gordon H. Chang. So I'm not him. But, but he's, he's just writing, he, he thinks China's economy is coming off the wheels, right? He just wrote something like this. He cons, he's, for the past uh, 10 years, 15 years, he's, re, he's re been predicting China's going to collapse. His book uh, you know, came out in 2000, Coming Collapse of China. And he keeps, people keep asking him, you know, what do you think about your prediction that hasn't happened? In fact, China's getting more powerful. More, and he says, well, it's going to happen. You know, sort of like, you know, it's like kind of, if you say, is the stock market going to go up or down? And you say, yes. <laughs> you know, something will happen, right? But, uh, but you know, you can have a legitimate and I think serious discussion about the problems in China and how serious they are and what they're going to do. But the, under t the tone of it, and that's when some of these books, you see, there's almost a will, f there's a wish to this. And you read his writings, and he sort of wants China to come. And that's where I have a, 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 a problem. I don't want China to collapse. I don't want the Chinese government to collapse. I don't think that's in anybody's interest. Even the most you know, radical d Democrats in China that I respect and sacrifice. And all, I don't think it's in their interest to have the People's Republic of China collapse. I think that would be a, <coughs> It's devastating for the whole world. Right now. It's like saying, well, we want the United States to collapse. You're sure there are a lot of problems here and you want to fix them. And I, my sort of attitude is I hope they fix them. And, and we can criticize and be critical in a way that is constructive. But in case. One last wanna... question. I think you had a question over here. Well, now you've called several. <laughs> uh, but, uh, Earlier this morning, we had a little bit of a, a dissection of the history of China as a, as a support system for understanding what's going on now. Do the, do the Chinese look at our history and attempt to do that about us? To, to learn from our history yes, about what they might do? Yes, you brought up the Exclusion Act, which I'm somewhat familiar with. Uh -huh. And my first question was going to be, what, what do you think the results of that have been all the way up till now? Uh, and then I thought, well, do the Chinese look at our history the way we have been setting up theirs, i.e., uh, the dynasties, the collapse of the dynasties into the republic, and then and moving on into... Uh, the, the Mao period and now the later period, do they do the same thing with us? Well, I, they, they have uh, hundreds if not thousands of people studying yeah. uh, social science and history mm -hmm. and all sorts of, I mean, the government, the top government has all sorts of advisors. They have huge think tanks. And I've met some of these people. You know, they're very, very capable. It's, it's been very impressive to me of how much they've learned about a lot of things in politics and, and, and international norms and so forth over the past 20 years or so. I mean, they really try to catch up. They know this is what they, this is the world in which they have to live, and they know there are a lot of lessons out there. So they're studying lots of things. They're studying uh, how the Soviet Union fell apart. That was one of their big, big issues. A lot of people in China, you know, for obvious reasons. You know, was Gorbachev uh, too liberal or was he not liberal enough? And that's why the Soviet Union fell apart. <laughs> In the United States, you know, they're just trying to understand. They do, they do have a hard time understanding federalism. They don't quite get it because there's not, there's, there isn't federalism in, in China, and it's the, the center has all the power. And they sort of, they, they kind of, but they are trying to understand. And so at, at Stanford, I meet some of these scholars who work for some of these think tanks, and they're visiting at Hoover or whatever. And we talked about federalism a lot. And, he, and he, I tell them, you know, there's what happened. This, there's the municipal power. There, there's county power. There's regional power, their state uh, prerogatives and laws, and, and, and he, he, he's interested to hear it, but it, it's just not quite in his. So they are certainly looking at all sorts of alternatives. There was an American political scientist who, who wanted China to go federal, and, he, and he, he said, why doesn't China become the United States of China? That is to haul the pre you know, to have a very different type of federal system. So I think that they are looking, but do they look for America as kind of a, a firm model? I don't, I think so. I think they have a very keen sense that China is quite unique, you know, Chinese characteristics and so forth. 